a reading from the book Monastic Disciples of Swami Vivekananda by Swami Abhijayananda This is about Swami Sadananda Swami Ji's that is Swami Vivekananda's immense faith in Sadananda's capabilities and devotion to service is evident from the fact that Sadananda was chosen by him to be the supervisor of the plague relief work which was started in March 1899 in Kolkata a plague committee was formed by the Ramakrishna mission with Nivedita as its secretary Sadananda as its supervisor and Swami Shivananda Nityananda and Atmananda as its members When plague relief work started on 31st March 1899 the people of Kolkata received the share of Swami ji's boundless love for humanity through Sadananda the rich left the city in great panic the helpless masses cursed their fate and the unfortunate victims of the disease awaited death this was the state of Kolkata then in this city of despair Swami ji's disciple Sadananda presented a picture of hope and fearlessness. His very presence had a calming effect on the panic-stricken people. The disease may first made its appearance in Kolkata in May 1898. Swami ji wanted to start relief operations immediately to help the afflicted. When someone asked him where he would get the funds for the planned relief work, Swami ji said, "Why?" We shall sell the newly bought monastery grounds if necessary. Of course, by the grace of God, this step was not necessary. The first thing Swami ji did was to draft a plague manifesto in Bengali and Hindi. Due to the hard work of Sadananda and Nivedita, this manifesto reached the greater part of the population and considerably has reassured them. There were hardly any sweepers to clean the garbage that had piled up in the slums of Kolkata. Most of them having left the city out of fear. So Swami Sadananda himself, with a broomstick in hand, used to go about cleaning the slums and lanes of the city every day. Day after day, he cleaned the foul-smelling places from which even the scavengers shied away. Seeing his example, many young men came forward as volunteers to help in the work. He would rush to the bedside of any plague victim he heard of, and forgetting food and sleep, would engage himself in his service. The educated citizens of Kolkata were speechless on seeing his dedicated service. When plague broke out in Bhagalpur in 1904, Sadananda was the guiding hand there also. behind the relief operations conducted by Ramakrishna mission Swami ji himself is the inspiration behind the various service oriented activities of the Ramakrishna mission aim of the mission is to make the vedantic ideal service to man as service to god practical how this ideal found expression in sadananda's life is repeated in a few incidents once when sadananda saw an ox beaten being beaten mercilessly he himself felt the pain on another occasion when he was staying at a charitable boarding house he woke up to find that he had been sleeping next to a leper he quickly left the boarding house out of fear and apprehension however after going a little distance it occurred to him that the leper was also god in human form he immediately returned back and served the leper with great affection for a few days on still another occasion sadananda was serving a small pox patient when some of the patient fell into a fire sadananda held him against his own cool body to soothe his burning body there are many such instances that bear testimony testimony to sadananda's matchless spirit of service which he had imbibed to a great extent from Swami Sharadananda during relief operations his zeal for service was a source of inspiration for the other monks yes
have a short period of meditation. song and reading very apt and appropriate for her talk, Leave for All. What is uh, living? There is a difference between living and existing. Living has a purpose. And if there is no purpose in life, it is just existing, like anything that exists, like any insentient object, chair, table, anything that exists. But human life, living has a purpose. Now, purpose of living may be three types. One is, we may live for our own sake, that is called swartha, selfish living. Everything centered in me and just I want to live for my grandiose life, comfortable life, for name, for fame, for richness, for wealth. That is one type of living. Many of us uh, do self-centered life. Uh, most important thing in life is his or her own self. Then comes family then comes neighbor, then comes society and country. But center of his living is he himself or she herself. That is called Swartha. Another second type of living can be person does little good to the world. As far as it does not contradict its self-interest. Self is at the center. But he or she outreaches towards other. It is Swarthi Paropakara. 
Parupakara is not the aim. Doing good to the world is not the goal. Goal is selfishness, but little outreaching others. It does help others if it doesn't hurt that person. And sometimes a lot of charity will find people giving a lot of money and uh, donating things and um, do, do all things, but behind that intention is not always good of the people, but intention is their name should be spread and flashed in TVs and in newspapers. It should become famous. Center is again the selfishness. But in that process, something good is done to the society. This is the second type of living. The third purpose of living is Paratha. List for all others. Center of his living becomes others. Other persons. Doesn't care about himself or herself. Purpose of his life is dedication of his all means and energies for the sake of others. So, with these three purposes, the best, of course, is how to dedicate our life for the service of others, and that is where the Vedanta comes. Because Vedanta says, whom you say others are not really others, they are your own self. They appear as others, no doubt, because you have no right sight. Your sight is defective. If you have right glass, right sight, then you will see those all as your own self. And living for them becomes your own goal of a joy. You derive all your happiness by serving all. Ultimate purpose of human life is freedom, emancipation, salvation. Freedom from what? Freedom from bondage from dependence. To become really independent is the purpose of life. Independent of all situations, circumstances, from all fear. So that is the purpose of life. And that can come by renouncing. What to renounce? There was one king who knew all these things. He is very thoughtful, powerful king. In when he came to the age of literary age of uh, sannyasa, he actually renounced the kingdom and his family and his all comfort and went to the forest, made there a hut, and started spending time in practice of spiritual disciplines, taking the name of God and practicing meditation. But time went away, but he couldn't find the peace that he was expecting can come from renunciation. One day he was in his hut, in the forest. He saw one holy man. He was advanced in age. There was aura of peace and blessedness and joy in the face of that holy man. He approached the person and says, Holy sir, I have renounced, I was a king. I have renounced everything, but uh, I have not found peace. Then, can you teach me how can I find? The holy man said, Renounce everything. The king thought, I renounced my family and retinue and all my father and came to the forest palace, everything I have given. What he wants, he renounce all what he possesses, he said. What I possess? This earth. Oh, he means this earth. So he brought down the earth and <coughs> threw it away and then started meditating under the tree. That was the only possession. After a few months, again that holy man came and he said, Sir, still I am not finding. You told me to renounce my possession. I renounced that heart was my possession. He said, renounce all your possessions and went away. Then he thought, I have this commander with this water jar and I have uh, my rosary and um, this thing, I think he, the holy man, wants me to give up that also. So one day he put the fire and kept burnt all those things. Now he had nothing, no position. Started meditating on God. Still, he couldn't find the peace that comes with renunciation as proclaimed by the scriptures. 
after one year again, he filed that holy man and said, Sir, I renounced all my protestants, but still I am not finding the peace. So he tried that. What to do? After a few days, he said, Oh, what the, what the holy man means? Maybe I purchased this body, oh, that is my purchase, and still I think I purchased this body. Then he means that I should give up this body also. He was ready to give up that. He put a, he lit a fire and was going to offer that body in the fire uh, at the final renunciation. Before he went there, luckily, and by chance that holy man came again. He said, stop, what are you doing? He said, you told me to renounce whatever I possess. I have renounced everything. I have nothing to say my own. Only this body is there. Let this body also perish and which will turn into ashes. My ass will be there of the body. Then the holy man said, that is not the renunciation. You are still saying it will be your ass. That renunciation is the giving up of the sense of mine is in what you possess. Nothing is yours. You have to renounce the sense of mine is. Sense of possession, not what you really possess. If you can have the things without the idea that it belongs to you, that is renunciation. Stop it. Practice meditation. Dissociate from the feeling that this body is yours. Be free from ego. Renounce your ego. Renunciation of the ego is one when you totally become free. Ego is power. Ego is the thing that binds us. Swartha, the selfishness, binds. Parartha makes us free. When we do think for others, that makes us free. That's why Sri Krishna said in the Gita, all actions, all activities bound us, make us slave for the sake of freedom. There is only one type of activity that will make you free while you work. Otherwise, actions are prone to bind you with fetters, with results, with consequences, with worries, all those come. So what type of that work is by which we can be free? He said, perform yajna. Yajna arthat karmano nyantra loko ayam karma bandhana. Whatever is done without the thought of performing yajna will be binding. It will bound you. You will be in fetters. Pasha will be there. So perform yajna. Yajna doesn't mean you have to perform fire worship. That is havana. That is Yaga. That is not Yajna. Yajna, that is a symbolic of Yajna. When you give up the things, when you offer the things, Yajna is offering yourself for the service of the society. All your actions are made for the good of others. That is your intention. You don't have to change anything. Whatever you do, only the idea changes, only the attitude changes that whatever I do, I do for the good of the world. And with this idea in the position when work is done, it becomes yajna. And when we perform yajna, it will free us. When we perform, when we will not perform things for the selfish end, it will bind us. That is the nature of the work. That's why Sri Krishna said, Perform everything with the idea of giving, serving, dedicating. Everything can be done with that attitude, that idea. Work is not different. Work is not important. Attitude is important. When that attitude changes, you are prone to free. Freedom is non-dependence, even-mindedness, and same-sightedness. It is unselfishness and self-expansion. Swami Vivekananda said, Contraction is death and expansion is life. That is true living. When we expand, what do you expand? Not your territory, not the size of your house, but you expand your idea of the self, self-expansion. That I belong to everyone. That is real living. 
when I contract myself and feel that I belong to only this body or only small family that is contracting. And that is Swami Vivekananda says, the more you contract, you come more towards death. When you are too selfish and you consider only your thing and you are not connected with the society, with other people, then you are dead, really. Living dead. That's why Jesus said, let dead bury the dead and follow me. They are only concerned with their little life, little eating, little enjoyment of this small, uh, this small, uh, you see, the span of life. And that is like death. Somebody had died. And his disciples said, we have to take care for that. He said, let others take care. You follow me. Have the teaching. Fill, fill yourself with the knowledge, with love of God. And that will make give you life. So, unselfishness and self-expansion that alone is living. When we have that expansion of ourselves to as much as possible, we have greater life. Sri Krishna said another thing to Arjuna. He said, Arjuna, this yoga, performing selfless action, serving others, doing everything in the center, putting all the whole world in the center is real yoga. The small yogi of Arjuna. Oh Arjuna, be a yogi. And yogi, the one who performs yajna. That is the concept of yogi and yajna go together. Who does for the sake of others. Who knows that what I do will be benefiting, doing good to others. Then every action becomes yajna and every human becomes yogi. Therefore, he said, this is the highest, Sri Krishna eulogizes in the Gita, this is the highest spiritual discipline among every other spiritual discipline. Therefore, be a yogi. And what the yogi will do? Sarva Bhuta Hiterata. Ever engaged in the good of all. Sarva Bhuta. Bhuta means being. Sarva Bhuta means all beings. Rata means engaged, always engaged in that. Sarva Bhuta Hite Rata, in the good of every being. That is the way to freedom, attain this emancipation, salvation, freedom. And how that can be attained? Samniyame Driya Gramam Sarvatra Samabuddhaya Te Pratnuvanti Mameva. Those who have same sightedness, even mindedness, Samabuddhi and self-control. These qualities are self. Self-control and even mindedness and same-sidedness. And those will get and a third is by with those thoughts then serving others. With these three qualities te prapnumanti maameva. They will definitely get me. They will realize God. They will realize and attain the ultimate goal of life. Another place also Sri Krishna says in the Gita, Sarva Bhuta Hite Rata Arjuna, one has to be engaged in the good of all. In verse 5, in chapter 5, verse 25, Labhante Brahma Nirvanam Rishayak Shina Kalmasa Chinna Dvaitha Yatatmana Sarva Bhuta Hite Rata. Those who are ever engaged in the good of all, they attain Brahma Nirvana, emancipation, that knowledge merging in the Brahman. They attain, realize the Brahman. Those Rishis who are free from Kalmasa, from sins, from weakness. What is the real weakness? Real weakness is keeping ego always in front of us. Remove ego, then you are purified. So those Rishis who are purified by by being free from sins and chinna toida yatatman again self-control and free from the perception of duality those attain to Brahma Nirvana by performing good to everyone Sarva Bhuta Hiterata but it is difficult to find the person who has attained the Brahman or realized God and always engaged in others but 
this quality, this potentiality, this power is innate in every human being. Every human being can attain the bliss of nirvana and the joy of realization of God. And those who have that, Vasudeva Sarvamiti. How do they do it? They see God in everyone. Not only that, everything is God. Not that God is in the heart of everyone. Vasudeva Sarvam Iti. Whatever we perceive is God, is divine, is my own self. And such type of great souls, Mahatma, this is Mahatma that Gita says, and Sri Gita says, that Sarvsa Mahatma Sudur Lava. They are not really seeing what they are available. They are rare, extremely rare, Sudur Lava. But that reality, to attain that position, is the goal of spiritual life. What does God do? God, in fact, Bhoktaram Yagyatapasam. He is the ultimate acceptor of all our Yagya and Tapas. To whom it is dedicated all our spiritual practice. It is all accepted by God. It is made for God. Because God graces and we perform spiritual practice. Whatever we do, it is accepted by God. Why God has to accept all the things that are done in the all the good things that is done in the world? Whatever good we perform, it is all will be given to God, credit to God, accepted by to God, because Vasudeva Sarvamiti, everything is God and nothing else. And God is two more qualities. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. He is the ruler, he is the Lord. Not only Ishwara, Maheshwara is the great Lord of the whole universe, whole creation. He is the soul of this whole creation, soul of all souls, Paramatman. And how is his nature? What is his relation to us? He is the soul. What is his relation to the creation? He is Suridam Sarva Bhutanam. He is the dear friend of every being, Surit, whose heart melts for the good of others. That's called Surit. It's not only friend. It's like it's like eternal companion, your bosom friend, who is one with you in all thick and thin. That's what the God is. Though he is the ruler of the whole universe. But he is serene. He is always connected with us. So whenever we try to do something good to all, then all grace will come from that eternal companion. He is always with me in my heart. Now the question comes, if living for others is so rewarding that we may attain even the ultimate freedom, mukti. But how to do this? How to do this? Simple practices. The first and most important thing to do this is feeling for others. Swami Vivekananda says, do you feel for others? When you feel for others, do you think so deeply that you feel that you are going crazy? You become mad to feel and think about the others, how to serve them, how they will be freed from the difficulties. Do you think your blood is boiling how to make world a better, better world, how to serve others. If we have done that is the beginning of spirituality, that is the beginning of his patriotism. When you think for the nation as your own self, spirituality will say, we have to go even beyond that, beyond the concept of nature, beyond the concept of humanity. It is up to the everything that exists. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. So this tremendous feeling for others that will give us how to be of service to them, how to approach them, how to uh, be in their vicinity. Sometimes it's too far, you cannot really approach everyone. But one thing you can approach, you can approach everyone through prayer. Whenever we see some difficulty, we hear something, we can always pray that may there be peace in the world. Immediately we get connected with 
everyone in the world with sincere prayer, concentrated prayer, if we do, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, may all be happy. Just think that, may all be happy. You already get connected instantly with everyone in the world. That is the way how to live for others. May all be happy. May all be free from disease. May there be no disease. This feeling itself gives me so much connectedness to others. That is the service for others. Another is charity. If you have means, you share your possession, wealth, money to with others who are in need, whatever you can do. And that is for your own good because that will broaden you and you make connected with God and say, Sri Raksri Krishna Paramastu or Sri Rama Krishna Paramastu, I offer these for the pleasure of my God. Because God will be pleased if I do something for others. So charity is another thing which connects us with the people, with all the people, whatever we can. So Holy Mother used to say, those who have means, they should give in charity. And those who do not have, they should pray. Jar ache mapo, jar ne jabo. Those who have, measure the things, count the things, give. If you do not have enough, then you do prayer. It is equally effective when you pray for the people who need your prayer, who need your good wishes, and it affects them. Suffering is not always physical, suffering is mental. When we pray with sincerity for the good of others, for the suffering people, if our thoughts are strong enough, it goes and goes and enters their mind and heart, and they suddenly find peace within them and are able to accept the suffering of their body, that is removing their suffering. Suffering is too much being attached to the body and joy is dissociating with the idea of the position of the body. This body I am, that is the main cause of suffering. And our thoughts may all be happy, may all be peaceful and that thought affects that person, acts on that person and that person feels, suddenly feels light, suddenly feels you know, that yes, this, this, I, can, I can bear. This strength comes. So prayer is very strong uh, way we can connect and serve others, serve all. And where we can do in feelings close vicinity, give your presence to others. In their good times, in their bad times. You have a lot of work. All our 24 hours are all uh, busy, we have all said. But we have to find time to reach and be in the presence of if there is you need some bereavement, some disease, some death. Take our time. That is very important. The spiritual practice is very important of living for all when we can be in the presence of the people who, who need me, who need us. You may feel, oh, there will be so many people going. What will my going to do? But everyone counts. Your going is good for them and it's much better for yourself that you connect and be present with them. You give a time, you give an energy and you present to them at the time of need. Need of two times. Need of time of joy and time of suffering. Both time being with them. So gift of your presence is a very important way by which we can live for all. There have been wonderful examples of how great person lived always for all. They didn't think about themselves. All their life was centered on others. Lord Mahasaya first one comes. A great householder saint of Sri Ramakrishna, deep disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. He was in East Bengal and his whole life was centered in God. And his whole life was for serving others. He didn't care for himself. One day, during winter time it rained and one, one person came to him, one guest came to him wearing through the water and shivering in cold and he said to his wife, bring some hot things and lit some fire. So wife said, if all the woods are wet, we cannot burn. Then he saw his own house 
one beam was there on the outer veranda and he said, oh, this is dry. I have to give comfort this person. House comes later, I can repair it later. So he brought down the external that um, uh, veranda beam and he chopped it and put in fire and asked the devotee, come and warm yourself up. How many can do that? Great self-sacrifice. No thought about himself. He can even tear the portion of his house for the good and comfort of his guest. Aditi Devo Baba. What we want to do when God comes? God comes shivering, Krishna comes shivering, Shiva comes poor, Jesus comes in need of something. What do you do? Will you take care of you need this or that? He is the king of our heart. So we do everything we can do. Guest for him becomes Devata. Same Sri Ramakrishna comes for him. The Sri Ramakrishna coming and that young man guest coming, no difference. He will try to serve him with all his might that was in him. It may mean some difficulty for him. Swami Sharadananda's life is so full of living for others. He was a very exceptional monk, a brother disciple of Swami Vivekananda, direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, first general secretary of the Ramakrishna Matan Mission. And so many problems went through him. He wrote the life of Sri Ramakrishna, the great master, which is now translated again as the divine play. Sri Ramakrishna, the divine play. And he used to serve Holy Mother, who was getting old and getting sick. So many people coming, he used to take care of all that. And he was the general secretary of the Ramakrishna mission, whole organization growing, branch developing, centers coming up new. He used to look after that. And then what he used to do? He used to take care of small things. Some student have little money. If all remains with him, he may spend. Give me. He used to keep that in the bank and whatever money he needed, he would give. I will give you only this much. You cannot spend more. If you spend all today, then how will you continue to study? He will take care of that also. Widows. They didn't know much. Some money was there. So he gave all the money of the widows. Few were there. And uh, he would take interest, monthly interest of that and would send that to them. Every individual seemingly insignificant part of the society were greatly taken care of by this person who was living a busiest life. Hundreds of jobs and responsibility on his head and but he never ignored anyone who needed his help. I will tell you at the end one incident how he loved human beings, how he lived for others, how he saw God in everyone. Nothing was there. Sadhananda's life we read. How unselfish, how living for others, how much self-sacrifice, no fear of death, no fear of catching disease, like plague or TV, nothing. I have to slaughter or leprosy. I have to serve others, all are equal. That type of dedication, feeling one with all and living for all. That is Swami Sadananda. Swami Vivekananda's life we know. He not only lived for all, but he inspired everyone to live for others. His religion, his Vedanta was live for others, serve others, and that will give you salvation. The way for emancipation, salvation, freedom, mukti, realization of God comes through service, through living for all. Before he came to the West, one day he met uh, his one of his disciples. And he said to him, Listen, my boy, Sri Ramakrishna came and gave his life for the world. I also will sacrifice my life. You also, every one of you should do the same. All these works are only a beginning. Believe me, from the shedding of our life blood will arise gigantic heroes and warriors of God who will revolutionize the whole world. Never forget, service to the world and realization of God are the ideals of the monk. He said that monasticism 
means loving death. I said by loving death I don't mean committing suicide. Loving death is conquering your ego, being free from ego and dedicating your life for the service of others. That is the main meaning of monasticism, self-control and service to the whole world. Atmano Mokshartham Jagat Hitaya Cha. The liberation can be attained only through Jagat Hitaya. Though these two are both inseparable, that's what the Ramakrishna mission stands for. He did that throughout his life, impelled by Sri Ramakrishna. He himself wanted to merge in Samadhi. Bliss of Samadhi is something those who have experienced, that is the most attractive thing. People say when you attain Samadhi, you don't want to even give up that. You can give up everything, you can give up your life, you can give up your body. Then become Samadhi so joyful, a state of so much bliss. But Swami Vivekananda wanted that. Sri Ramakrishna said, no, that is not for you. You have to do a lot of work, mother's work. When you finish that, then mother will open your key and you will attain that state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Swami Vivekananda started working for others, serving others, removing the suffering of others. How will everyone get the joy? And he finally, finally did that and wanted his close people, his monastic disciples, his non-monastic householder friends to dedicate their life for the service of others because that will bring them the highest good. Holy Mother, her whole life was for the sake of others. She didn't care for herself. Once she was old, and uh, at 1.30 a.m. at night, one disciple saw one lantern or light went out. When he saw Holy Mother is carrying, what is she doing? And he said, she was taking out the pebbles and the broken earthenware from the courtyard of the house. And the disciple said, Mother, what are you doing? He said, you see people come, they, they walk barefoot, and their legs, the food gets cut. So I want to remove these. But he could say that to anyone, anyone could do that. Why you have to do it at the dead of night? Am I not mother? Is it not the duty of mother to serve her children? That was the concept. Everyone was served as her own child. Service to all. Sri Ramakrishna, as we said, he lived for all. His door was always open. Anybody could come anytime. There was no private time for him. Sometimes drunkards will come like he goes. At midnight will come. Sri Ramakrishna <coughs> would be always welcoming. He himself also slept very little. He used to get up early in like midnight. So for him that was the thing. Always he was open for anyone that would come. And he was talk incessantly. All wonderful talks made of like a nectarine like talk. That's what the Yam says describes about Sri Ramakrishna's talk. Living for all. What Buddha did? His whole life after realization, after Nirvana, was dedicated for the good of all. Giving them knowledge, teaching the, his disciples to go to the village and serve people, give medication, like a plant, Ayurvedic medication, whatever is relevant and known at time. Treat people, that was Buddha's thing. And he was ready to sacrifice his own life for the sake of a lamb. How much service to all, living for all was Buddha. And what did Jesus did do? Jesus' whole life was for the sake of the good of all. And he knew that how the good will be there, good will be there by loving God and by serving all. Good thoughts, good actions, those are the only way by which we can become closer to God. His whole life was that. And ultimately, though he had to be suffered and crucified, but he didn't defi deviate from that. And his, all those suffering was for the good of all. Relying on the center of his crucifixion, we find so many people love Jesus because of that one reason that he gave up his life with so much suffering for our sake. 
That's the feeling and love for Jesus grows because of that one incident. If Jesus had mother could spite for her, those people would not understand Jesus' love for human beings. Those who say, but Jesus' life was not only crucifixion, his whole life, whatever he lived, was for the good of all. He didn't mind suffering, being misunderstood, being said by something, being imprisoned, nothing was there. He lived for the good of all. And then I would like to read from Swami Sarudananda. To this song, also very relevant it was. In Hindi it is, the song, opening song that was done, that, Oh Lord, if I cannot do good to others, please let me do not in anything that is bad for others. I don't boast that I will do good to others, but may I never do anything that hurts, hurts and harms others. And may I always be with the devotees, and their hand on my head, their protection with me, and may I always repeat your name in my heart. May I always be with all and serve all. Let me read from Swami Sarada and his life, who life was the epitome of living for the sake of all. Swami Asisharanda Ji writes. Asisharanda Ji was head of our center in Portland for many years, Holy Mother's disciple. And he lived with Swami Sarudananda as his secretary, very intimate with Swami Sarudananda Ji. As Swami Sarudananda grew older, he could no longer personally look after the health of our sick monks and devotees. But he still gave his love and sympathy to the ill. One day, when the temperature in Calcutta was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Swami Purnananda called me and said, Swami Saradananda has just left the house. It would be good if you would follow him and inquire where he is going. Walking quickly, I reached the Bhagavadar Street, streetcar depot, where I spotted the Swami. As soon as he saw me, he said, It is rather hot. You better go home and rest. He himself, old person, not very well, he will go in this heat, but he will want this young brahmachari or young sannyasi to go back and take rest. Think for living for all, thinking for others. I told him, I would rather go with him. He gave me money and I bought two first class tickets and we climbed aboard. Where should we get down? I asked. Ezra Street, the Swami replied. After five minutes, we reached the street and I helped the Swami off the car. We walked a few minutes in the stifling air and arrived at a building where a devotee was living on the second floor. The devotee named Khokani was a Parsi who was suffering from advanced tuberculosis. He was overjoyed at the sight of Swami Sarudananda. Khokani coughed almost continuously and was not careful about sanitary rules, using his hands instead of a handkerchief when he coughed. Nevertheless, the Swami sat on his bed and comforted him by putting his hand on his head and massaging it gently. Khokani asked his brother, who was caring for him, to go buy some fruits and sweets. Within minutes, Khokani's brother returned. Without first washing his hands, Khokani peeled the fruits, sliced them, and arranged the pieces in a dish with the sweets, offering them to the Swami. Khokani, I protested, Maharaj had just finished his meal. I don't think he will be able to take anything now. Swami Asesananda Ji is aware of the disease and its infective nature. But Khokani insisted, Please take something, Swami, he begged. It will make me happy. Swami Sarada Ananda took a few slices of fruit 
and a few sweets and gave the dish to me. I also took a little and the Swami's prasad. The Swami sat quietly and meditated a little and then took leave of Kokani, asking his brother to keep him informed of the sick man's condition. On our way back to the Udbodhan, I said, Maharaj, you should not have taken those fruits. I have heard that tuberculosis is very infectious. Your life is precious to all of us. Swami Saradananda replied by quoting Sri Ramakrishna, No harm will come if one accepts the food given with a loving heart. After a few days, Khokani's brother reported that the sick man had passed away, comforted by his memory of the Swami's visit and his love. I realized then that sanitary rules were not as important as fulfilling the wishes of a dying man. I recall the words of a Hindu poet, who can fathom the depth of feeling in the hearts of great souls? They may do things mysterious to us, but their actions will always bear a deeper meaning in the eyes of God. So this is how this great man lived for all, without anything caring for themselves, the life centered in others. For Artha, that is the goal and that is the way for attaining the ultimate ultimate purpose of life, which is this emancipation or mukti. Thank you.